Hey everybody, what is up? It's Antonio. Welcome to episode 31 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. I'm so excited to get into this episode with you, but first I just wanted to jump on here and give you a little heads up that this episode's audio and video for those who are watching on YouTube or using Spotify video, uh, the quality is not as high as it's been. There were a few hiccups with some software and that kind of thing, so I apologize for that, but it will be better in the future. I'm very excited for some things coming down the pipeline. So thank you so much for understanding. Now let's go ahead and let's get right into episode 31. Today I have a very special episode for all of you listening. I am so excited for episode 31 of Teach Play Disc Golf, a Gladiator Disc Golf podcast. Now, if you've been listening for the last couple episodes, or if you're new, I want to welcome you. But if you've been listening for the last few episodes, you know that the guest I have today, I've mentioned the last couple of times over the last few weeks. He's someone who's been giving me a lot of helpful tips and coaching. He has some great content on his Instagram page. And so I figured it was about time to have him on the show. So I am super excited to welcome Tanner McCartney to Teach Play Disc Golf. What is up, Tanner? How's it going, man? What's going on, man? I'm doing pretty well. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you. Tanner has been awesome behind the scenes guys we have been having some <laughs> technology issues and basically it all comes down to the fact that uh i'm trying to run programs on a macbook that might as well be a potato at this point so <laughs> it's been a little rough but tanner i appreciate it man it has been course, great just dude. chit-chatting with you while we work through these yeah, things dude. all right guys so i'm gonna go ahead like every other show i'm gonna run you through the outline and then we'll get into the good stuff the stuff that you came for so we're going to start by talking to Tanner and just getting to know him. I have some questions, and but more importantly, I have questions from my Discord server. So from the members there who are uh, asking Tanner some questions, I'm sure they can't wait to hear what he has to say. After that, we are going to talk about the back end. Yes, we talked about it in episode one, but here we have a pro uh, talking about it. And I'm super excited to pick Tanner's brain. I'm sure you guys are excited about that too. And then we're going to talk about, we're going to wrap up the episode talking about the USDGC, something we are all looking forward to this week. So without further ado, let's go ahead and let's get right into it. All right, Tanner. So I know you and I have been talking, getting to know each other for the last, you know, 45 minutes mm -hmm. to an hour. It's been awesome. I know we've messaged back and forth a little bit too, just mm -hmm. talking disc golf and life and things. So that's been great. But one thing that we haven't touched on that I'm sure we all want to know is how long have you played disc golf? We'll start here. How long have you played disc golf? And how did you get into disc golf? Yeah, so I've probably been playing for like six and a half years, probably coming up on seven. Um, and yeah, so I, I started kind of halfway through 2017. I was in my junior year of high school. Um, I kind of got involved like everybody else does. I had a couple of friends um, who, who played. Um, a lot of my, I hung out with a lot of older people uh, when I was in high school, a lot of the, like the college group at my church. Um, and a lot of them played ultimate Frisbee. And so we had a disc golf course at one of our, one yeah at one of our local parks and they brought me there and i had i don't think i even really knew what it was um and they took me and let me a couple of their discs i don't That's even awesome. know i don't think i even knew that they were different names for the discs then. <laughs> um so um played a couple times and was hooked um and shortly after maybe within a couple of weeks i bought you know three discs or me and my dad actually yeah. bought three we each got three discs off of amazon and uh nice. started playing more and more from there but all right uh now let's go ahead and let's get into the, man these discord members ask some awesome questions and so i am super excited to uh to ask you their questions and so for those of you who are listening if you want to have future opportunities like this to ask a pro a question make sure you join my discord server link in the description all righty First question, you've kind of touched on this a little bit, but kind of go ahead and give us a high overview. What is your, what was your disc golf journey, growth and development like over the last couple of years? Yeah, um, so, I um, mean, yeah, I got hooked very quickly. Um, and I, I, I've always been a, I've always been a dreamer. Um, mm -hmm. I've always tried to 
I've always tried and I've always wanted to make my hobbies and passions my job. Um, I knew from a very young age that I didn't want to have a job like everybody else. I wanted to be able to I wanted I wanted to be able to do what I loved every single day. Right. Um, That's awesome. And so when, when I when I picked up disc golf, um, it was more when I first found that there was tournaments on YouTube um, mm-hmm. and seeing like grown adults doing this as their living. Um, you know, I knew I, almost immediately. I knew that this was something that I wanted to try to pursue. Um, and I mean, I went a couple years without telling anybody, um, but but I knew deep down that that was what I wanted to do. And so um, I went on YouTube and did what anybody would do, you know, was trying to figure out how to throw the disc correctly. Um, and I knew, you know, you always hear everybody on, on Jomez or whatever you're watching, um, right. you know, how long these guys have been playing. They've been playing for 10, 15, 20 years. And I came to the conclusion that if I perfected the mechanics early on, mm-hmm. that that would help me jump you know, for the lack of experience I had right, in, in time, right. the good mechanics would help me kind of climb a little bit quicker. Um, and so that was kind of what I what I clung to early on. Um, and I was a firm believer of um, working hard, but making sure I was working smart and efficiently. Because mm-hmm. um, I think anybody can work hard, but if you aren't developing good mechanics, then you're it's like running on a treadmill. You know, you're you're yeah. not you're not you're not making that much progress. Um, and so, you know, it wasn't always fun, but, you know, early on yeah. I was like, I realized I was like, I should be throwing from a standstill and, you know, be figuring out where I need to be reaching back and, and what that needs to look like and what that needs to feel like. And so mm-hmm. I kind of just took my legs out of it. And this is maybe, I mean, maybe a couple months into playing. Wow. Um, How did you and I was just, how did you make that decision? Like, so we hear so many players talk about they've been playing for years and they finally mm-hmm. decided to like take their form seriously. Did you have someone mm-hmm. alongside you, coaching you, kind of guiding you along this process? Um, yeah, I had a couple. One of my friends' um, dad, he was, I mean, their whole family was really big in Ultimate, but he was the one who actually designed the course and put it in. Um, he was all sidearm, though. Um, and I didn't, I, I wanted nothing to do with, with a sidearm. Um, and so, I mean, he was, he was a good person to talk to, right. um, but backhand, he couldn't really help me a whole lot. Um, but I just was able to gain, gain Frisbee knowledge and course management kind of through mm-hmm. him. Um, but then my youth pastor, he was, uh, he grew up in Michigan, so he had played a lot of oh, you know, yeah. great courses and, um, and he had pretty, he had pretty good mechanics, um. And he was probably the only person in, in our group of, I don't know, 10 of us um, who could probably throw 400 feet. Um, and it looked and it looked pretty smooth. And so, yeah, I knew if he was doing it, there was, you know, right. I knew I could be doing it too. Um, and in my head, like I, from what I saw on YouTube, it was like, go to a standstill. It's easier to learn. It's easier to break things down. And so... Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of my logic was like, you know, sometimes like you have to take one step back to take two steps forward or, mm. you know, two steps back to take one step forward. So you can take multiple steps forward after that. Um, right. and so to me, that was the best thing I could do. And, and the course that we had, um, it wasn't super long. So a lot of the front nine, I could play from a standstill. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I just kind of started learning that and learning, you know, I was trying to get control with, with just without using my feet and so once I kind of figured felt like okay like you know these are coming out more or less where I want to let me start trying to add the feet Uh Um, and I think that was was very um, helpful because I feel like now a lot of people that I'm teaching um, it's like they don't know how to move their upper body without moving their feet and it's almost Mm, like they just yeah. they dig themselves in this hole that they that they can't ever get out um oh man so it's something I, i'm it's something i'm thankful that i did um but yeah that was kind of the that was kind of the start um and then it was a lot of field work i mean like i say within the first couple of months i was going out to a field and i bought a tripod and set up my phone and mm-hmm. was was filming myself because i remember the first time i watched myself i was like whoa i'm doing nothing <laughs> that i thought i was doing you know? <laughs> I thought that's I was back here like that's, like, cla- like, that's so classic. I thought I was you looking like Paul Macbeth or way. something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, and 
but but even that was like just sparked a, a bigger addiction and obsession with it. it was like man i i thought i was doing this and i'm doing mm-hmm. none of it you know yes. so i was like i gotta yes. figure out how to do this oh man um, well that makes me so glad to have you on to talk about the backhand because yeah. you really are someone who pretty much from the beginning like once you're like hey i actually like this you pretty much started taking it seriously and understanding Mm -hmm. everything that's involved with that with the backhand especially so i have a lot of questions but we will get to talking about the backhand specifically a little later i want to ask you a few more before we move on so for those who aren't familiar with tanner he is sponsored by mint discs they're located and they're based in austin texas um and so, you know, one of the questions that one of the Discord members is uh, asking is, why did you choose Mint over other companies? Yeah. Um, so when I moved to Austin, um, I didn't I didn't even know fully of Mint until maybe a couple of years into Austin um, or me moving here. But they run a lot of events up here, mm-hmm. and the events that they run were felt very different from all the other events. Um, oh, wow. they, they were run very well. They they dressed up the courses with banners and, mm. and signs and flags and, you know, you name it. Um, and so they, I enjoyed playing their events because they made the sport feel more professional. Um, and that was, that was one of my first, you know, um, one of the first things I remember. Um, but then I just, I just remember, um, I mean, everybody in Austin just talked about them and everybody was like, mm-hmm. oh, my disc, you know, yeah. oh, I throw this disc, oh, I throw this disc. <laughs> blah, blah, blah. And, uh, and so, so the community was definitely one of the things that, um, you know, the community here in Austin very strongly supports them. Um, and so, I mean, it was just a natural, it was natural for me to be drawn, drawn to that because um, um, they had good people surrounded by Mm-hmm. you know but surrounded by them but it, it just it just showed me that that they were good people deep down as well so i knew i wanted to be a part of it very cool how uh how far into like their lineup basically how many discs did they have when you officially joined and when did you join team mint um i so this is my second year okay second full year right so in december it would be it would be, it would be my third okay. um and when i joined the team I mean, I clearly remember when I got sponsored by them going into the warehouse and they had tons of discs there, but thinking back on it now, the only moles that they had in stock were the Royal Bullets. Mm -hmm. Um, I think they had Royal Profits and they had Apex Alphas, which at that, which this run, it's the current fourth run of Alpha, which is like almost firebird like yeah so um, more stable and maybe royal mustangs i mean uh, there was there was there was not i mean they had yeah. other they had released other stuff but they were out right. of stock for a lot of those yeah um, so, so hard to keep it in stock yeah for oh yeah for sure um but i mean zach and guy and chris herbert the three owners they you know pretty much brought up their stashes and and gave me everything I needed. Um, and shortly wow. after, I mean, I think within that same week that I got sponsored by them was when they just released the Swirly Sublime Alphas, Ooh, uh, yeah. the fifth run, yeah. uh, the, the, the Skullboy ones. Yes, um, I have some of those. <laughs> yeah, those were sweet. Um, and so, you know, I was bagging those, um, but early on it was pretty much, it was pretty much yeah. just the Alphas and, and the bullets really that they had in stock. So without further ado, Tanner, let's go ahead and let's start talking about the backhand. All right, you guys, so let's go ahead and let's talk about the backhand. Now, Tanner, going all the way back to the beginning of the episode where you were talking about your story, your intro to disc golf, you gave a lot of background and it basically sounds like you had no interest in the forehand, you were only (laughs) interested in the backhand, and you had someone in your youth pastor, which is really cool with someone who's a natural teacher, then being able to teach you disc golf and have good mm-hmm. form while doing it. You know, it seems like you've had some help along the way and you've been able to just progress in your skill level. So, you know, we talked off camera a little bit. I'm really going to be letting you kind of drive the train here and just kind of telling me, telling the listeners, telling us 
what mm-hmm. we can learn and grow from and just kind of how you think about the backhand. So I'm sure everyone appreciated the tip from a couple of weeks ago. So I'm sure we're uh, happy to hear more. So I'll yeah. just start it off with this man. When you think or teach the backhand, what do you focus on first? Yeah. Um, yeah. When I teach lessons, um, you know, everybody's different. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and what they're struggling with. And I, I think everybody learns differently. Um, so it, it varies from person to person, but um, I would say 70% of the time, um, I do put people in, in a standstill, um, especially if it's their first lesson with me, like, you know, they're wanting me to tell them everything that they're doing wrong. And so a lot of times I do that and then they're like overwhelmed with, with <laughs> you know, all the things yes. that, you know, they need to focus on. And so, um, my goal when I teach, when I'm giving lessons is to equip these people so where they, that they don't have to keep coming back to me. Mm-hmm. Um, so my goal from the get go is to help them be able to identify their mistakes and, and what they're doing wrong and how to fix them on their own. Um, I think that's what a professional does. And that's why the pros at the, t- at the highest level are so good and are so consistent because they can make a mistake and automatically know, oh, okay, I, I need to stay tucked, you know, stay tucked in a little bit longer on my next throw. And they can they can fix those mistakes right, right away. Um, and so that's something I, I really focus on is trying to equip everybody with the knowledge of, of how to fix their mistakes. So um, like I said, yeah, a lot of times I put them in a standstill first that way they don't have to think about the lower body. They don't have to think about all the steps and everything. And, and I try to work on, you know, really trying to get, you know, the reach back, you know, going back to, to, a, to the right direction it needs to be. Um, and then also trying to incorporate the hips. Um, I think a lot of people struggle with, with in, you know, using the hips to really derive the swing um, and, or at least to initiate the swing. A lot of people are starting with the pull and then the upper body and lower body is just moving together where the hips need a twist first and then the upper body comes in after that. Um, and so that's normally what I, what I try to focus on is just trying to make it as simple as possible for them. And I think, mm-hmm. you know, standstills can be uncomfortable for a lot of people because a lot of people don't do it. Right. But I feel like in the long run, it helps because um, you aren't having to think about so many moving parts you know it's so hard to figure out where you're trying to reach back yes. or trying to do the x yeah. step and and trying to plant at the right time because then you have all that timing so it's mm-hmm. just like just try to make it as simple as possible from the get-go well i i love hearing the way you're talking about this because it's just validating for me and my own mm-hmm. journey and 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 in coaching just being like guys simplify it start with this yeah, yeah yeah and you kind of alluded to this a little bit starting from the ground up like when you're talking about the the hip rotation and yeah. basically you alluded to the lag that should come from getting the hips and the lower body mm-hmm. going first. If something's supposed to be going first, then it makes sense that, hey, we should be starting with getting that timing dialed in. For sure. So like, let's, let's start, you know, with that now. Let's work from the ground up, so to speak. Mm-hmm. You know, how should I, we'll focus on, you know, a couple of the big parts here, like our feet. Mm-hmm our hips, and then we'll move into the upper body. But like, what was, what is your recommendation for our feet? And let's stay in a standstill here. Let's not worry about the X mm-hmm. step right now. But like when we're yeah, yeah. planning our feet for this standstill, how should, where should they be pointed? How should we be positioning them? What is your recommendation? Yeah. Um, so like if you're right hand backhand, and this mm-hmm. is pretty much just reversed, if you're left hand, um, I always recommend that your front foot is um you know where your your feet are shoulder width you know it can be it can vary depending on how tall you are and your length and your body weight um but i would say your front foot should be out and your back foot toes should be lined up with your back with your front foot's heel Mm -hmm. so if this is your front foot right then Mm -hmm. my my back foot should be lined up with your heels more or less you know or it could be in the middle but you don't want them even uh-huh. Um, I always, you know, talk about baseball players with the way they bat and the way they swing. That whole motion is very similar to disc golf mm-hmm. and how their, their, their plant foot is coming out away from their body and not with, you know, not in a straight line, it's coming out away. Mm-hmm. And that's just able, that's 
that's enabling them to get more hip rotation and more hip mobility. Um, and so that's kind of where, where I start, you know, I, I put their feet there and a lot of times that does help them, um, or allows them to engage their hips a little more. Mm -hmm. A lot of times you see people, you know, line up straight with each other, like, like you would in golf. Right. Um, and it's a little bit harder to get as the hips as yeah. involved as, as you need them to be with, with that stance. So, um, that's normally where I start for sure. Yeah, for sure. Because I know I've heard a lot of coaches talk about getting those hips closed kind of before mm -hmm. going into your your uh, your plant foot and gliding mm -hmm. forward there. And so if your legs are perpendicular, then they can't really close because there's no way for them to rotate. They're I mean, you, you can get a in. little bit of movement. Yeah, right? a I mean, little you, bit, you but not as in much. Golf, they, can, they can rotate them a little bit, yeah. but not not as much, um, yeah. not as much as, as yeah. needed. Um, well, in, in ball golf, you see that front hip on those guys pop up. So they're driving yeah. their, uh, their hip up. Whereas in disc golf, if you do that, you end up throwing into the sky. Lots of good information there. Okay. So it sounds like then, you know, kind of, you know, my assumption with this too, was there's a lot more going on in the lower body when it comes to the throw. Uh, when yeah. it comes to the backhand throw specifically, there's a lot more going on and it just shows the importance of having a solid foundation, mm -hmm. pun intended, mm -hmm. <laughs> for, for your backhand throw to make sure that you have good foot spacing, that you're mm -hmm. getting those hips and you're not popping those hips up. A lot of important mm -hmm. things that all lead to the timing of the upper body. So let's go ahead and let's kind of move up the uh, up the body here a little bit, because if we have mm -hmm. this much movement happening in the lower body, if it's like our natural inclination is to assume there's going to be a lot of movement and power coming from the upper body as well. But mm -hmm. I have a feeling, you know, based on my experience and growth, that, <laughs> that that's not actually the case. So how about yeah. you walk us through a little bit, like once we do this with our lower body, what happens up top above our hips? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I think I think a lot of people are surprised, myself included, when I when it first kind of kind of clicked, is like how little effort you really have to put into your upper body. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's another hard part about this sport is like, in in my opinion, when when you're trying to throw, your lower body is not tense, but is a lot more active um, and <clears throat> strength. You know, it's it's under strain, I guess, you know, during the movement, but your upper body needs to be very relaxed and very bungeed. And so to be able to kind of have that explosiveness in your lower body without yeah. tightening up in your upper body, I think is, is a skill of its own. Um, and so, yeah, going into the upper body, I always teach people like, I think everybody needs to figure out a percentage of like, I can throw about 300 330 pretty much with a noodle arm mm -hmm. just allowing my hips to drive and then this i'm just guiding my hand through this motion mm -hmm. i'm not actually pulling through um, and so that's something that i try to talk about is is allowing or reinforcing that it's not us pulling through it's right. our hips twisting us and we're just guiding our arm into this right. power pocket motion it's not us actually driving it to a certain point you know um, and so I think after that, then you are driving it, but that's, that's when you're trying to throw, you know, a lot further. Yeah. Um, and so that's something I'm focusing on is with people is, is really just making sure that we're coming through this, you know, coming through our power pocket or the motion, right. um, but allowing the hips to initiate and to drive that through. I love that you got to the power pocket here because you kind of helped me on getting this elbow up when I throw. Mm -hmm. And it's one of those things where that tip, I don't know if you know this, resonated mm -hmm. with a ton of people. Mm -hmm. And they a lot of people were saying, I had the same problem. This is so helpful. So can you kind of walk us through, like when it comes to the power pocket, how close should we be to our chest? What, is, yeah, what yeah. should everything look like? Because we see all the pros keeping everything out. But then when mm -hmm. we throw, we find our elbow dipping down. And so we've yeah. basically turned the power pocket into this like pulling motion that mm -hmm. has the elbow pointed down. So can you kind of walk us through like what, uh, what should it look like and how can we get there? Yeah, um, I always say disc <clears throat> golf and the mechanics are all about straight lines and, and, and sharp angles. Um, so, you, you know, you want everything to be 
you know, you want everything to be flush. You want your wrist to be flush. You know, you don't want, you don't want your wrist coming out. I see a lot of people when they're reaching back, like they come out and we want everything to be flush. Um, you know, but then you just want, you want this 90 degrees, you know, that 90 degree pocket. Um, right. and so I think the best way to build muscle memory is using some sort of tension, you know, using a resistance band, putting it on a, on a door, then, you know, sitting in the mirror, um, making, you know, or, uh, having some tension allows us to feel the muscles that we're using mm-hmm. and kind of, I feel like, um, just makes, helps us with the mind body connection. Um, so that's something I always recommend, um, is just getting a band or having a buddy hold a towel, you know, behind and then the, them just coming, you know, getting to this point, but using the hips to get them to this point, you know, they're rotating the lower body mm. and then, and then the upper body gets here. Um, those, I mean, that's, that's the biggest thing I, I mean, I have a couple, I have a couple drills that I do at home, um, that maybe we we can somehow share with with you know i can make yeah. a video and we can share people or some people can reach out um there's one i do in, in the doorway that's that's yeah. great um but yeah i mean those are those are some easy ones that you can do with a friend or you can do you know by yourself for sure very cool very cool okay last thing okay mm-hmm. um we've talked lower body we've talked upper body the head you know we we you you know, when you're driving, if you start reading a billboard sign for too long, what ends up happening? You start drifting towards that yeah, billboard yeah. sign, you know? So I feel like the head is, the eyes especially, are overlooked a lot of times. What is mm-hmm. something like a quick uh, quick little tip that you can give us for helping us keep our heads where it needs to be? And first off, you know, start with that. Where do our head, where does our head need to be? Yeah, um, I can't remember who taught me this. Um, but, or maybe I, maybe it was something I taught to somebody else. I feel like someone told me this, but, um, someone said, imagine, um, like a camera guy on a movie set, right? They have those big mm-hmm. cameras on their shoulder. And when they're, when they're turning for a shot, they don't just, they're just moving the camera, right? They're moving their entire, right. their entire body. Right. Uh-huh. Um, and so I think for the most part, that should be how our head works for the throw. You know, we're looking at our target for about as long as we can until mm-hmm. we're rotating, and then the head just comes with us. Um, and I think that's where the backhand is more difficult, and the mechanics are so important because you have to have trust. Mm. You have to turn away from the target. And I think that's why so many people always talk about, oh, I go to a sidearm and I have to hit gaps because I can see the gap the whole time. Mm. And I think that's why the backhand is so difficult. Um, and can be mentally taxing is because you have to have some amount of trust right. in your abilities to be able to turn from the target and have confidence that you're still going to turn around and, and yeah. you know, hit your line. But I think that's where the reach back to is so important of where you're reaching back because you I- ideally want it to come right back at to where you're aiming. Um but yeah, that, that kind of camera movement is something I, I try to focus on is just allowing it to come, you know, stay with our shoulders as we're, as we're turning yeah. around and then coming back. I see a lot of people try to turn too soon yeah. when, when they're coming through and then that causes them to rotate their upper body too quick. Very cool. Well, dude, you gave us so many great things to talk about. So many nuggets of information and in we talked about um, the feet the hips, mm-hmm. the the power pocket, which is so important, and really just how the emphasis needs to be on our lower body, keeping that upper body loose. You know, I'm thinking about everything you're saying with the head. If you're super tense, you're not going to be mm-hmm. able to move that upper body yeah. smoothly. Yeah. And you know, everybody, you know, it sounds like a, you know, it sounds like a lot of people are kind of sick of this saying, but like. Yeah. Uh, what is it slow is smooth and slow and smooth is far uh, you know, yeah, everybody, yeah. everybody hates hearing that nowadays but for about yeah. five years danny lindahl was the man yeah. and it was yeah. just such good instruction and i think a lot of us took for granted exactly what that meant because we yeah. never broke it down to to this kind of level and so i appreciate you uh doing that for us and i know i learned a lot I hope that you guys listening learned a lot and were able to really glean a lot of things from Tanner, 
not just about like his uh, coaching, but also his background, a lot of the tips that he gave and and just his experience of developing and becoming a, a better disc golfer. You know, if if you want to become a better disc golfer, yes, there's all these tips that he gave and that we discussed, but you got to start mm -hmm. with the standstills. Mm -hmm. Leave the X step at home. Don't take it with you out to the course. Yeah. Work on those standstills, improve that way, guys. That's going to be the best way. Like Tanner said, one step back for two steps forward. That's where you'll get the fundamentals down. So uh, that's basically all that we got for the disc golf skill. We're going to spend the last few minutes here of episode 31 talking about the USDGC, one of the biggest tournaments of the year. Let's go ahead and let's get right into it. It's Rock Hill, North Carolina, Winthrop. It's going to be good. It's always good. It's always fun to watch, but I got to say the last couple of years have been a little weird with some of the stuff that yeah. they've put on the course. Yeah, for sure. um, it's definitely made watching it interesting. It sounds like the players find it interesting as yeah. well, for lack of a better term. But, you know, uh, I've talked about this this a good bit, but what are some of your thoughts on USDGC with its you know 30 plus years of history and with some of the uh, recent changes that they've made? Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think it's cool. I think some of this stuff is, can be a little gimmicky. Um, but I think a lot of people forget or don't realize that, um, this technically, um, it, it's like an X tier. So like yeah. the ratings don't really apply to anybody's, they, it shows the ratings, but it doesn't apply to anybody's profile, um, which I think maybe is why they put so much out of bounds and kind of do some ridiculous mm -hmm. stuff because, it's just kind of who who's gonna go all out. Um, so I like it. It's one of my favorite tournaments to watch um, because of what it brings out of people. And I think people realize that they're just gonna full send it from from hole one, you know, right. because if they have the worst weekend of their life, they're not thinking about how it's gonna affect their rating. So I, I think it's always fun to watch. I never even noticed that the X tier, like, you just, mm -hmm. I don't think you realize this, but you just straight up called me out there. Like yeah. <laughs> people well, not realizing. I, I, I don't know if it's, cons I don't know if it's considered an X tier because it is a major, um, it, but I know the, that the ratings, uh, but the ratings don't count. Yeah. On the PDJ website, I'm looking at it right here. It says the tier is XM. Yeah. So that's an, yeah. an X rated yeah. major. Wow. So, I mean, these people have no, have, have no reason to not go for the hero shot if they're out of position and they need to go for it. You know, huh. it's like, you might you might as well you know um wow not not to discredit anything but i, I think yeah. i think that that makes it exciting and that makes people want to go for the bigger shots and go for the right. eagles or go for the crazy you know putts or whatever for so sure. i think it's i think it's always exciting yeah that's actually a really good point that that's i'm definitely having to like process this now because it always yeah. bothered me now you know like i said lots of process but i do think that there does come a point where it's like, okay, yes, the ratings may not matter, but some of mm -hmm. this is a little extreme. You know, some yeah, of it yeah, seems yeah. a little goofy. You know, there yeah. is a uh, uh, a line that you don't want to cross. And I don't have an issue with a lot of the OB. I think mm -hmm. the issue that I have, and I'm sure some of the players have that are actually there, even though they might be able to see it better, is it's hard to tell where yeah. the OB is sometimes. I think if it was more clearly As defined viewer, for the cameras yeah. but even for the yeah. players because there are some i remember hearing some players yeah. saying like you throw it but you don't really know if it's in bounds yeah. because it's like these yeah. weird little pockets and shapes mm -hmm. so i definitely think that that is you know you never know something's gonna fail unless you try and so i definitely yeah. think over the years they've tried some things have kept some got written some of those the mozzarella sticks off the tee yeah. are a little strange <laughs> i like them around the basket on that one i think it's like hole 13 yeah. or something yeah um but those that's a pretty cool touch that it's basically like trees and it affects the yeah. approaches but yeah you know it's definitely a cool tournament a lot of prestige there have been some incredible winners you know it's usdgc week so Disc Golf Pro Tour has been posting on social media about the epic battles between Ken Climo and Barry Schwartz and how they went on a 10-hole playoff with yeah, 19 yeah. birdies. So there's yes, a lot of history crazy. at this course. Uh, there's a reason why they keep coming back. It's over and over and over. And so you just get to see this consistency. So I'm just kind of yeah. wondering, as we are prepping for this week, we're all going to be watching it. 
who are you keeping your eye on this weekend to perform? Yeah, I'm looking at the list right now. Um, I mean, I hate to be that guy, right? But um, <laughs> I feel like I feel like I don't think Calvin's going to win it. I'm 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 knocking him off. I don't think oh, it's wow. going to be him. Um, I wouldn't be surprised to see Isaac Robinson. I'm thinking of the course, and I feel like a lot of it you can throw the backhand turnovers mm -hmm. on a lot. You don't really need the sidearm. Um, but Except I, I maybe hole that, seventeen. That was, I was literally about <laughs> to say that, but yeah, the hole seventeen. But Isaac is so butter with, yeah. with the putters. Yeah. Um, but I wouldn't be surprised to see Ezra Robinson also pop yeah. off. Um, yeah. I think he has potential. I think he plays better in the open, mm -hmm. in the open courses, and has all the power. Um, mm -hmm. So I definitely think the the Robinson brothers will will make a splash. Um, yeah. That'd be yeah, pretty you, you incredible for Isaac to win Worlds and then That'd to go sick. and follow it up with USDGC. That'd be even more incredible for Prodigy because yeah, last year be, was Gannon. And then a few years before be that, you had Chris Dickerson when he was on Prodigy. Yeah, so That's true. I didn't think yeah. about that. So they and uh, they had Katrina Allen win Worlds when she was on Prodigy. Yeah. So they've been yeah. having a lot of success given all the uh, – given all the uh, – perceived issues and problems that they've been having you know they've been having a lot of success with their players it's just it's that flashing <laughs> that flashing produces changes it's that flashing and they can't keep them <laughs> they can't keep them. Uh, yeah no, i hear you though when i when i look at this lineup i'm like okay he's everyone's you know probably favorite disc golf personality it'd be so cool to see simon win a major mm -hmm. like this um really cementing his name among a lot of other greats but like even yeah. outside of winning i'm really we were talking about a little bit before i'm really excited to see um where do you go will schusterick is back and he's yeah. playing uh for those of yeah. you who are that's awesome you know new to disc golf within the last three years you may have heard of this guy or maybe never heard of will schusterick but basically he was like the Calvin and Eagle and all of, all the skinny lanky guys out on tour. He was like the first of them kind of thing. He was the OG Gannon Burr. The, the OG Gannon Burr. And that is paying big homage to Gannon saying, you know, being like Will Schusterick. So great guy. Dealt with some injuries. Then uh, family stuff happened, but it's good to see him back. Uh, it'll be really exciting to keep an eye on him. I, I don't think anybody really has any I can have legitimate expectations of how he'll finish, but I think it's just going to be cool to see him out on the course. Yeah. I think guys like Eagle and Ricky are going to really be, you know, trying to get the win because they've had some weird years. They've been in competition in a lot of tournaments, but I feel like we haven't seen them in the winner circle nearly as much as we mm -hmm. used to, especially with Ricky, especially with him. Yeah, I'd love I know, to see Ricky up there. Yeah, I know with the whole Lyme disease stuff in the first half of the season, that was really throwing him for a loop. But it'll be cool. You have a bold prediction with Calvin Heimberg not winning or coming top three, but he's he's got to uh, get over that hump at some point. He's got to yeah, finally yeah, get the for victory sure. for on sure. one of these soon. So maybe it'll be today. Maybe it won't. I mean, there's a lot of people going against him. So we shall see what happens. I'm super excited for this. And uh, guys, yeah, like too. I do every week, I'm going to make my grip six picks once they're available. I'll put them on Discord. I'll share them on Instagram. I want to hear who you have. We already know who uh, Tanner's looking out for. So it's been a lot of fun. Tanner, it was so good having you on episode yeah. 31 here. Uh, it was a pleasure learning from you and talking to you. Before we sign off here, is there any closing comments you want to make? Do you need to shout out any sponsors or anything? Yeah, for sure. Um, I'd love to <laughs> shout out Mint Discs for supporting me for the last two years. Um, Armory Disc Golf, they're one of my retail sponsors out of College Station here in Texas. Um, they've supported me very well this year. Um, and then Camber Disc Golf, they're out of Pittsburgh. Um, they've done a fantastic job as well um, supporting me and, and helping me grow my brand. Um, so yeah, the, those those three really have been, have been uh, huge having them in my corner. That's awesome, man. Well, everybody, I teach play disc golf. We focus on a couple of things here. First, teaching people how to play. Go out this week. Go out this weekend. Grab somebody new. Take them to the course. Teach them how to play. Share this episode with them to encourage them. And if you can't bring anybody new with you, 
go ahead and give an encouraging word online and make sure that you yourself go out and play some disc golf this weekend. I'm excited. I have, I'm not spoiling any news here, but I'm playing with some uh, pretty cool people this weekend. And I'm excited to share that with you guys. So that's all I have for you today, everybody. Until next time, have a great round. See ya. Uh,